So as I said, um, the idea here is, uh, you know, really like taking a kind of a fresh look or, or, or think about interledger. A lot of this, as I mentioned in the, uh, in the explainer, is not new stuff, but I think it's stuff that's worth revisiting on the basis of where interledger has come and how it's evolved. Um, and a lot of it is the outcome of, you know, a year plus work that myself, Matt and Don have been doing um, related to Interledger. We've, you know, we've done work on Rafiki, we've played around with um, the ILP Connect implementations in various languages. Uh, and we've basically, we've toiled with the idea of figuring out how we make this easier for people. Um, and, and why, you know, the developer experience or the onboarding experience feels so challenging uh, and so here's a you know really this is just a couple of ideas around that and some proposals around things we've been building POCs for um, it's it's not it's definitely not a suggestion that you know we do anything dramatically different so uh, since putting out the explainer I've had some really positive feedback and I've had some very concerned feedback from various people uh, let me state up front, this is not ILP version five. <laughs> this, is, this is not suggesting we change ILP in any fundamental way. It's, it's more about the, um, the protocols and the things we build on top of it and how we deal with the end-to-end -end side of ILP. So, uh, you know, really the intent here is, um, is get, uh, you know, get us talking and, and debating these things. So that's kind of a rough outline of what I'm gonna talk through, you know, the background, the motivations, um, the, the sort of famous internet hourglass architecture that we use in all of our presentations and discussions around RLP. Um, then a little bit about the sort of getting started with RLP experience and how I think, you know, maybe we could improve that. Some specifics about the current end-to-end -end protocols, the current uh, what we call transport and application protocols and where I think we can improve those. Um, and then some uh, discussion of the things we've been playing with. So, you know, OAuth and, and an old idea that Nikhil de Jong and I worked on a while back that sort of, I don't want to say it got shelved, but it sort of uh, went a bit stale on the back of, you know, everyone focusing on stream. Uh, and I want to relook at that idea and see if, you know, it wasn't actually worth some more merit. Um, so let me start by saying, you know, this is this is going to sound like a lot of critical discussion and a lot of saying like what we're doing is wrong that's not the that's not the intent like interledger is uh is awesome um i think you know we've done an amazing job to build a protocol that has incredible potential uh and a lot of what i'm saying what i'm going to propose is really just saying let's be pragmatic about where it fits into the world and where uh you know protocols like the internet that we're modeling it on uh, fit into the world and how long it's taken them to get there. So let's let's not try and you know short circuit the process. Um, let's be pragmatic about what we can do with Interledger today. Um, so a lot of the slides are a little bit wordy. I apologize. Um, I do want this to become something people can take and debate and um, tell me I'm crazy and have you know something to refer back to. Uh, so so some of the slides are a bit wordy, but I'll I'll try and get through them reasonably quickly. Um, so starting off with the background and motivations, uh, one of the things that I think is um, become very clear for us at COIL, and I want to say, you know, all of this is very much coming from my perspective. I think Matt and Don will share a lot of what are the ideas and thoughts I say here, but this is certainly not a COIL view of the world. Um, this is a, my personal view of things, having done this work for a while. So I just want to put that disclaimer up front. But but one of the, you know, I'm wearing a lot of hats at Coil and and among those are, you know, working at W3C with people involved in, you know, the architecture of the web and browsers and, you know, how do we get web monetization into browsers? Another one of those is, you know, Gates Foundation work, Module Loop, the development of, you know, new mobile money clearing systems on the back of the interledger primitives so you know the module loop apis that use like interledger conditions and fulfillments and are wanting to use interledger style kind of addressing for interoperability and so on and then the third side is you know 
specifically for coil, how do we grow the interledger network to enable web monetization? And, and then, you know, that means like when we're talking to existing digital wallets out there, existing people, existing entities who are payments companies, they're businesses that handle and do payments. What does it take, you know, if we put like, if we were to, you know, walk in their shoes, what would it mean for them to interledger enable their existing wallets? Like, what does that actually entail? Uh, and, and it's been a challenge. So I think that's been quite informative to a lot of this. And I think what it boils down to is really a, um, you know, a vision for Interledger and how it is used and how it fits into the world and deciding whether, you know, are we using Interledger to try and take what exists in the world today, existing payment networks, whether those are card payments, Alipay, WeChat Pay, uh, bank networks, et cetera, um, blockchain networks like XRP Ledger and put pull them all together? Or are we trying to build something new um, based on Interledger that ultimately, you know, people will start to all migrate to uh, in time? And, and I think those are two, those are different paths like that to get to those two um, sort of futures. And not to say that ultimately the end result might not look similar, but, uh, you know, when we talk about interledger in the real world uh, what do we actually mean by that are we are we creating something new or are we trying to come up with something that you know pulls everything that exists together so a lot of what follows is kind of premised on this vision of interledger as something that's connecting the existing systems of the world and and so when i talk about you know we go to existing wallets and existing um, entities out there and say to them, what would it take to interledger enable your wallet? That's what I'm thinking about. I'm not thinking about how do we get them onto this new parallel thing that, you know, that, that doesn't exist yet or, or that we're trying to build. So um, on the back of that, what are, what are some of the things we've learned over the last year? Uh, and, and I'm just gonna run through them one by one. And, and Matt and Don, feel free to sort of step in here if there's anything you wanna add. I'll, I'll give a pause at the end. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges, and, and this comes from this idea of the internet architecture and the sort of the hourglass architecture we try to stick to so, um, so closely, is that we sort of think of ILP in those terms. And so, we draw a lot of parallels and we say, well, if you want to do anything on the interledger network, you will need to run a node. And if you're on the edges of the network, you run an edge node. So you run something like MoneyD. Um, and, and while that's appealing because it, it matches the sort of analogy, it matches the internet metaphor really well, it's really difficult because uh, it means that, you know, doing, building interledger into stuff you do is, is in my opinion, unnecessarily hard. So, you know, if you just want to be a sender or a receiver, there's, there's a lot that's involved there and, and that requires you to pull in software that's been written by other people or to go and understand the kind of the full stack. Um, so when we originally started playing around with this idea of like building things on the edge of the network, we took the existing RP connector reference implementation and we immediately said, no, no, this thing's not architected properly for this. This isn't going to work. Uh, and we thought that was the problem. And so we, you know, we built Rafiki and it was a reimagining of a connector implementation. Um, but after all of that, we actually discovered the challenge is not really a better connector. The challenge is a better developer experience. The challenge is the right tools for building with Interledger that don't require you to, um, you know, to understand the full stack to, to do things. Um, and and the, the thing is, you know, Interledger is, is a really simple thing to understand. When you look at the slides, and I think Evan and Stefan especially have got it down to a fine art of explaining Interledger, um, it's, it's not complicated, it's, it's really powerful. But then when somebody says, okay, I get it, you know, I wanna use it, how do I do that? That, that conversation is much longer and more complicated. And, and it's, well, you need to now understand this encoding format that uh, we've adopted. It's, it's standardized, but no one else really uses it. Um, you have to understand this, you know, other protocol we built on top of it called Stream, which is kind of a full transport layer protocol, um, you know, analogous to Quick, which is being developed by, you know, an army of engineers at Google. 
but you know we've we've done a, something and it's it's just a difficult it's a difficult thing to do so despite the work that's gone into it being incredibly clever and you know powerful i think the that it creates a massive hurdle for anyone new um to the whole thing and I, and i think one of the challenges we've had is we've again we thought about it as this is internet like so you know nobody cares about their tcp stack right so we'll just build an implementation of that stack and people can just use it they they don't need to worry about it but i think that's a little bit naive given that you know <laughs> the protocols and and so on are so young um and the implementations are still only just being finished in fact some you know are not even complete uh and yet you know we want people to adopt this protocol uh without you know where the way they do it is they just take that code and use it so so i think that's been you know that's at least one of the a couple of the challenges or a few of the challenges that that we've identified there um the result of those is that you know users who and we see this over and over again you know on the forums and on slack people go to the getting started guide they download money to you they try to do things and invariably if something goes wrong they have no idea what to do next because the the getting started with interledger is not like this is how you start sending a packet it's this is how you download a bunch of things that do a lot of complicated stuff under the hood but don't worry you don't need to understand all of that um which i think is a mistake like if you uh if you want developers to get interested in this thing it needs to feel like using stripe or paypal or any of these other um you know similar services where you know you say cool it's a standard so lots of people do it the same but it should be as easy as here's a curl command to send a packet uh or you know this is how you can do it directly from within a browser i think if you can't do that we were already like not that we failed but we're making it really difficult for people to to get their heads around so i think that little blurb at the bottom of that slide we kind of for me uh, epitomizes a typical conversation that i've had multiple times especially recently you know talking to people who want to um understand more about web monetization and they sort of enthusiastic about what will it take for us to you know build this into a browser and you sort of explain how it works and they go okay cool we get it so you know there'll be this ip address and and we'll need to send packets to that and there'll be an uplink and we'll send to that okay um but you know how how do i actually use it now now that i you know understand the basics and then you get into this as i said you know this long conversation about well actually you've got to implement this other protocol called stream and you've got to implement all of these binary and you know encoding protocols and so on and so forth and and so it's not something someone can just like sit down and do simply i think the develop experience is really challenging um you can't for example just send an ilp packet from from your from your cli or or even from a little piece of javascript you need to import oer encoding libraries to do that uh so that's just that's just one example um and and i think i've kind of alluded to this but my my conclusion from all of that is the the current architecture um you know the way we approaching into ledger is really is is strongly premised on this idea that it's analogous to ip and that it will be kind of built into our platforms and built into the stack and we'll you know just like we have a network daemon we'll have a money daemon i.e. money d and that'll run you know in the background and applications that want to send money will do it through money d and and i think it's a it's a it's a noble cause and i think it's could be the way things pan out but the reality is that's not going to happen for a very long time and so i think we need to have a way today to engage the payments community and the broader sort of ecosystem and and get them interested in using our p uh on the back of its really powerful features like its addressing scheme and its idea you know the conditional execution um idea and and then you know work from use cases and figure out like how do we solve specific use cases so i think one of the challenges we have today is the stack we using really only solves for web monetization and we've tried to solve for some other use cases and most of the time it's very complicated or like it's a bit hacky like we we have to make some compromises at least that's been our experience so i'm you know i'm fully um i'm i'm going to put 
put myself out there and say, you know, tell tell Matt and Don and I that we're clueless and that actually um, we should have just tried harder. But uh, what we found is that you know using slightly different ways of doing the the payments is actually easier. And and you know for me one of the pieces of evidence of that is if you look at some existing implementations. Uh, certainly the newer ones, Rust and Java, and I'll confess to not knowing them inside out, there are endpoints that they expose that try to abstract away all of the existing stuff. So they have like pay endpoints, for example. Now that's not standardized, but that's the only way to give users something that's actually makes sense for a use case to, to send a payment. And that just, it feels like, you know, there's an unnecessary amount of complexity hidden behind that uh, unnecessarily. Okay, so so next little section is probably one of the more contentious sides. And I think um, that's probably because we've become so accustomed to this hourglass architecture and the stack and talking about things in these terms. Um, and, and, you know, I've been as big an advocate as anybody else with this. I've spent many hours, you know, um, deep in conversations with, you know, yourself, Kincaid, Evan, Stefan, various people about, you know, Interledger as this core protocol within the stack and, you know, the, the ways it could do things that IP does today and so on and so forth. But as I, you know, as I looked, you know, as we, I was kind of going through this process of trying to understand where I think we could simplify things, um, I started to sort of unpack, unpick this analogy a little bit and, and there's things here that, you know, we've debated in the past and sort of never really came to a conclusion on. But one of the, one of the core things I think is that this, you know, where we've ended up with ILP4, we're actually not that close to the IP stack as we think we are. And, and I presented um, a lightning talk on Interledger at the DWeb camp um, earlier this year and one of the sort of veteran internet uh, guys who was there was in the audience and he was the first person to put his hand up and say, well, actually guys, um, this doesn't really match that because uh, you know, your interledger packet isn't actually carried inside any sort of encapsulation at the ledger layer. That's, you know, that's how ethernet, for example, carries IP or, you know, other things, you know, they frame the, the, and encapsulate the layers above them. And, and he was right. And, and, you know, um, we, we sort of agreed that that was how things were originally in ILP version one. It's no longer the case in ILP version four, but we, we still felt like, you know, the, the architecture sort of held, but as I sort of went through it and, and looked at the details, I think actually at the end of the day, we only really have two layers because nothing we've ever done in what we call the application layer was encapsulated within the lower layers either. We've talked at great length about the potential for using the data channel, for example, within stream to build application layer protocols, but it's, it, it's never actually been practical and no one's ever been able to do anything useful with it. So what we actually have is not an application layer protocol. We have a setup protocol. We have a, we have something that's more analogous to DNS, where I give you a payment point or a URL, you use that to effectively look up an address. You get an address plus a, you know, a shared secret, and then you use that to communicate with me over a, you know, a different transport or, or basically over ILP versus the web. But it's, it's not like you're using SPSP over stream. So I think that's the first place where I believe the, the whole thing breaks down a bit. The, there's no application layer, it's, it's set up. Uh, the, the transport layer thing is like, that's a personal bugbear of mine and I'm happy for us to keep calling it transport. All it does is cause a huge amount of confusion whenever I'm trying to explain this to people because it's not really a transport. It's, it's, where, the, it's where we take you know, ILP packets and combine them to form a payment. We, we, we complete a sort of some sort of commercial operation using one or more ILP packets that are exchanged. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I'm putting forward a proposal to think about that as more of payment protocols than transport protocols, but I'm, I know that's probably a fight I'm, I'm not gonna win. Um, 
but the po most important point is like if you look at the internet uh, sort of architecture and the ILP architecture, the only place where we really have any sort of encapsulation is between ILP and the things that it carries in its in its data payload, and and in this case, in in our case, uh, that's mostly stream. But when I dug a little bit deeper, and I've been doing a bit of work recently on sort of legacy payment systems for Modulub, it start to, I started to remember a lot of the things that I had be, been familiar with in the days of working in the card industry, and and I started to look at where we've actually ended up with Interledger, and and What's awesome is that you know we we built this protocol that was very inspired by the internet. Um, you know, so I've been working on it with Stefan and, and Evan for probably close on five years, and I came from a card payments background. I, I knew the card payments protocols well, but those never really fed into what we were doing with Interledger. It was always about um, the internet and replicating sort of the the amazing things that the internet has done for for data. But what's really interesting, and I, I and and I, I, you know, I point that out merely to to indicate the coincidence. What's interesting is that actually, Interledger Four has ended up looking more like a payments protocol than the internet protocol. It it has more commonality with a protocol called ISO 8583, which is the backbone of all card payments globally, uh, than it does with IP. Uh, it's you know, the, here's the field comparisons. Um, in terms of you know address an, a way of addressing the messages, but fundamentally, um, I think the amount field is the one that you know that really stands out for me. Is that you know Interledger is a thing that carries it's a message carrying an amount. It's a clearing protocol, and ironically, when I was talking explaining our Interledger work to somebody uh, uh, in Japan recently at TPAC, uh, he was a guy from Stripe who understood payments, and the very first thing he said was, "Oh, okay, so connectors are kind of like clearing houses," and 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 he's right. Like you know, we've had these debates on the calls the last few times about you know what is the regulated entity that runs a connector? You know, what does that mean? And the reality is, uh, if if we look at Interledger in a world of you know regulated payments and participants on the network actually being um, appropriately regulated, the chances are that like a connector that has multiple you know peers and is switching pa packets um, all over the place is going to be effectively a clearinghouse. And I, and I think it's no coincidence that a piece of software you buy today that um, does exactly the same thing for ISO 8583 messages is also called a switch. Like this is this is not coincidental. Um, and so I, I'm kind of challenging us to to think a little bit about uh, whether interledger is more of a payments protocol and actually a really really good upgrade of the existing um, real uh, real time payment protocols or at least retail payments protocols it has so many commonalities and in fact more i think than with ip so for example um, you know when you send iso 8583 messages over the card networks they're doing from a business perspective, almost exactly the same thing as Interledger um, packets. They're clearing between participants. Each person who passes on that message um, has a settlement relationship with the next entity, and they do clearing and settlement after the fact between them. Um, they also uh, have a hierarchical address space. So card numbers, PANs, are a hierarchical address space. Uh, if you take your card out now and look at it, you'll see the first digit will tell you which network your card was issued by or, or, or which the network the issuer is on that issued you that card. The next few digits will tell you, you know, the issuer, so the bank. The next few will be the, the product uh, and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's a hierarchical address space in exactly the same way as ILP addresses are. And what is for me was kind of the 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 thing that really was definitive was ISO 8583 is a request response protocol in exactly the same way as ILP. You know, messages are sent over the network, then a response comes back, and the, it's the combination of that request and response that's the completed transaction. Um, so a huge, like really strong um, metaphor there, in my opinion, stronger than the internet metaphor. But what's really awesome about ILP is it improves on ISO 8583 dramatically. 
it it adds you know the the fact that we've stripped out all of the business logic so you know iso 85 83 messages are extensible they have you know feel the the field 127 is the sort of extensibility extensible field but not in the same way as um an ilp packet payload is where it can carry higher level sort of protocols um but then it's also loaded full of stuff like you know the settlement amount and system trace audit numbers and the uh, condition of the point of entry where the transaction was captured and so on and so forth so it carries a huge amount of like business logic tied together with the payments and and what's great about ilp is by separating those two we we then create a protocol that's sort of agnostic not only of the underlying settlement but also of the payment instrument so you can use ilp for anything you know payments initiated from a card from a phone uh it doesn't really matter it's it's a much more sort of it's a much leaner protocol that's specifically just for payments and the sort of business logic can sit in the in the protocols that you build on top of ilp Another really powerful thing about ILP is we chose not to use addresses as identifiers. So ILP addresses are these ephemeral things that sit in the background and we've devised this idea of payment pointers as the, you know, as the publicly shareable identifier. And, and, and that was clever, whether we intended it or not, it was very clever because it matches the direction payments are going. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, we have a much more flexible address space you know ilp addresses are extensible and we've done some really clever stuff with addresses uh, because of that so we can encode small bits of information into addresses we can create new addresses per transaction and so the privacy uh, the 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 sort of properties of ilp that allow people to preserve their privacy are really powerful as well which i think um is you know is is really useful uh, especially these days when privacy is becoming more and more important topic but finally i think the, the you know it's the condition and fulfillment part that are sort of the coup de grace for for interledger the the ability to send a message to a known peer but understand that they're going to switch that out over multiple networks um, and you will still have certainty that it was delivered to the intended end recipient uh, i think is is kind of the game changer and what that means is instead of having to use this protocol within a global scheme which is what what card networks uh, provide you can actually um, you can be innovative around how the technology fits into the regulations and so uh, i think we're going to be able to and that's where i think the internet analogy makes more sense is you know we've got this tech that allows us to internetwork networks no differently to how ISO 8583 does, but because of the condi conditional payments property, we those networks don't necessarily have to all exist under a scheme. And I and I think that's a that's a you know a, a critical um, sort of piece of the puzzle. Conclusion on this whole thing is that you know for me Interledger is a payments protocol. Money's not data. It's it's got to be treated differently. It's regulated differently. Uh, and, and like the more we go down this road, the more we're realizing that. And, and I think the internet analogy, while it was useful to inspire us and get us to where we are, is a bit of a stretch. And, and I think while it's can continue to be helpful and it's probably, uh, you know, a useful thing to, to still reference, I feel a little bit like everything we do and a lot of the way we think about solving problems is still driven too much by this analogy and this idea that we should solve it the way the internet solves it. And, and I think that is to our detriment. The other section I want to talk very quickly about is kind of onboarding. Uh, and if you look at getting started on Interledger today, you know, if you're someone who comes to the, the website, you think, hey, I'm interested in, you know, understanding about Interledger. So you click getting started, you end up with you know, this tutorial that takes you through what is basically seven steps to sending a payment. Now, the challenge there is all seven steps are basically just shell commands. You just go even stuff to copy and paste into a client. You have absolutely no idea what's happening under the hood. It could be software that literally just prints something on the screen and says a payment was sent. Um, you, you don't get to, you know, as uh, my assumption is that for a lot of the people who are coming 
to the site. They're, they're technical people, they're developers. They want to write some code, send some REST you know, API calls, something that feels a little bit like how they've tried to integrate payments into their applications before. Um, and, and that's not what they get. They, they end up with you know, installing a bunch of uh, pieces of software, MoneyD, um, ILP, SPSP, et cetera, uh, basically just running a little closed payment network, which doesn't prove any of the real value of ILP because it's a closed network anyway. And it doesn't really give them a realistic idea of how they will probably use ILP in the real world anyway. Because the chances are, is if you're building ILP into your application, you're probably gonna need some concept of an uplink. You're gonna need some concept of authenticated, a bilateral connection to that uplink. Uh, and then you're gonna have to be able to send and receive packets. And, and as, we've, as I've said before, that means then you have to go and grab a pile of complex software that someone else wrote and just stick it in there and, and sort of hope for the best. I don't believe that's an ideal onboarding process. Um, unless of course you're talking about targeting people who wanna run connectors, who are, wanna be part of building the internet infrastructure, then maybe, then maybe that's right. And so one of the conclusions, which I'll get to later is that I, I think we do need to bifurcate our sort of approach a little bit and say, you know, there's a way we wanna approach getting onboarding people or getting people familiar with ILP because they want to use it in their applications. And then there's a way we want to get people familiar with ILP because they want to actually run uh, IntelliJ infrastructure. So, you know, hypothetically, I think a getting started guide should look something like this. You know, you getting started is, hey, here's a list of, you know, uh, wallets who provide test accounts. Go there and get a test account. Um, get a get an API key or a bearer token or whatever for that test account, um, fill it with some imaginary money, and then use the credentials you have to send some Interledger packets through that account. Like use Interledger to now make some payments out of that account and create an account on another wallet and get the see what address it gave you and send packets to that account and, and see the difference. That's for me, a way more intuitive and useful experience as someone who's learning about ILP and, and then seeing you know, the balances change um, on those two accounts on the basis of these messages being exchanged. The next thing I wanted to very quickly go through were what I think are some of the challenges with the existing stack. Um, again, I wanna emphasize, I'm not saying we should stop using these, I just think these have a specific use case or specific uses that maybe um, that that shouldn't be ex exclusive of any other use cases or other protocols that could be used there. So for SPSP in particular, like this was something we came up way at the beginning of the whole journey. It was supposed to be kind of a quick fix. This is you know it's the simple payment protocol. It'll just be for like quick setup and you know the way it's worked has changed a couple of times along the way um, but ultimately we've ended up stuck with it if you like and and the challenge with SPSP is uh, you know that it's it's too simple effectively you you know payments are inextricably linked to identity there's no way to tie those things together um, where we've tried to use it for more complex use cases like pull payments it's it's not been a great experience. Uh, the only way, for example, to give someone a payment pointer that would allow them to pull money is to basically create one that's difficult to guess, um, which, you know, in my opinion, is is a bit of a nightmare. But be that as it may, I think we can improve on SPSP, and I'll talk a little bit about some ideas we have for doing that. Stream, on the other hand, is is the opposite. I think Stream is the future. I mean, it's a it's an incredibly clever, uh, powerful protocol. Um, I think the choice of modeling it on Quick was inspired. Uh, you know, what I'm seeing from engagements at IETF or W3C is that Quick is definitely the future of internet uh, transport. It's um, you know it it's being adopted widely. It's going to be the basis of HTTP three, but it's built on a foundation that's like 25, 30 years old. And, and I think that's what is our challenge is that we're kind of, I think we're trying to short circuit that process and just say, well, let's not bother 
you know, getting there. Let's just build this full stack that replicates the internet stack, and then we'll get people to build on top of that. And, and as Matt pointed out, I think, you know, the mistake we're making is we're building with no knowledge of what we don't know, with no real consideration of use cases, and just assuming we can just build more stuff on top of it later, um, which I think is a mistake. One of the one of the criticisms of the protocol itself I have is that you know the the um, connection establishment is is way too slow. So I, a theme I've noticed amongst a lot of the newer protocol development work is an obsession with uh, what guys are calling zero RTT. So, you know, how do we establish connections with minimum round trips? And stream, you know, by its nature is very chatty to get a connection established. Uh, it has to, you know, do a lot of probing packets, figure things out about the route, et cetera. And, and, you know, that in the future, that may be okay where, you know, we've, we've figured out ways to really optimize, you know, underneath that and, and, and make that easier. But if I look at some of the challenges we have today, for example, in web monetization, you know, every time somebody changes a page, clicks a link, moves to a new page, in the background, we're having to create a whole new stream connection. And there's always a significant lag while that all, you know, sort of winds itself up and gets going. So I think that's a big disadvantage. The, the two very clever features of stream, the bi-directionality and the, the multiplexing, I think just add complexity we don't need, to be honest. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, I, I can't think of a use case where it's useful to establish a connection with someone and then for some reason send money in both directions. That's just not the nature of how money works. It's, it's sure, it's, it makes sense with data, but not really with money. And then, you know, the same I would say for multiplexing. I, I'm not entirely sure why I would establish a connection with someone and then need to send different streams of money to the same entity. Um, that that you know I, I'm you know as I say stand to be corrected, but but I think that's that's unnecessary. And and I think this is evidenced by the fact that um, you know as as the various implementations have tried to implement stream and realize how challenging it is to do stateful connection management, they've actually not bothered with a lot of the connection management aspects of stream. And so as far as I know, the implementations of stream in, in Rust and Java are not complete. They, they do the bits that are necessary to, for example, allow for web monetization, but they're not full implementations of the spec. Um, and, and, you know, I, I do think web monetization could be done using a much simpler protocol that doesn't require binary encoding, doesn't, could, you know, could be initiated directly out of the browser and, and doesn't require bi-directional packet flows, uh, which would significantly simplify things. Um, the octet encoding one is, uh, is, a, is controversial. Um, I know uh, this was the thing that I think prompted some people to say to me, are you inventing ILP5? Um, I'm not, and, and I don't think octet encoding should be done away with. I just think it's unnecessary at the edges. I think we should uh, assess really carefully whether it's absolutely necessary for edge nodes to encode things in using OER. Um, if they could just send them in something simpler and then more sophisticated infrastructure nodes can then take those data elements and encode them as, as OER. Um, you know, that's how, that's how a lot of REST APIs work. You know, a lot of people are using, for example, REST APIs to speak to entities like Stripe, like PayPal, like Braintree, who take those payment messages and turn them into binary encoded ISO 85, 83 messages on the card networks. So it's, there's precedent there. And, and the reality is we just create one additional barrier for people who want to learn about ILP. A lot of this is in the explainer, but I want to very briefly give you an idea of some of the things we've been working with and playing around with that I think could address some of these use cases. Um, I explicitly have put them there alongside the existing protocols because, as I said, I don't think they replace anything, but I do think they're a little bit more practical to use today for some of the use cases, well, certainly the use cases that are important to us. So, um, and, and the reason I think they're useful is if you like take a payment today and you abstract it away and you look at the steps that are required to complete a payment, it generally abstracts down to roughly the same thing. 
you know, I, I get some sort of payment instrument, a card number, a payment pointer, uh, an identifier, Apple Pay, you know, login, whatever. Um, and I use that to basically discover who, who's the issue of that instrument? Where's the money held behind this thing? Then I communicate with that entity to figure out like how are we actually going to do this payment? Then I get authorization of the payment from the person who owns the account. Um, and, and as a result of that, the payment is actually cleared across a payment network and finally settled between all of the entities. So on the card networks, that's you know, compressed down into quite a, into effectively two or three steps where the discovery setup and authorization are pretty much happen at the same time because you know, card numbers and card uh, network participants at least are all on the same network and card numbers, while they're addresses, they're also identifiers. So I give you my card number, you can immediately plug that in and, and execute a, a, a card payment. Digital wallets, roughly the same, you know, you scan a QR code, you use your, uh, the PayPal address of the person you're sending money to, but these are all closed silos, they're network specific. Uh, and so the setup and the authorization portions and even the clearing tend to be very specific to the network. They don't, um, they don't provide any sort of easy way to interoperate with other, uh, with other networks. I, I can't see, for example, um, how an Alipay and a PayPal might interoperate easily. It's it, without something like Interledger. What's encouraging to me is the, the, the open banking APIs and PSD2 in the direction those are taking because I think they have you know, really embraced the abstraction, but they fall short, I think, in the discovery phase because um, there's no kind of universal way to identify payment accounts. And that's where I think payment pointers are really powerful. So what you end up with is you want to check out on a store and you want to pay using your open banking, uh, using your, your bank account. You actually have to often pick which bank you bank with first. You actually have to tell the store uh, where to go and find your account. And then after that, they use OL2. So they use OL2 and they... Um, uh, they basically create the, they set up the payment, they get you to authorize it using standard O2 stuff. The FAPI profiles are basically just extra security on top of O2. Uh, and then the clearing is generally um, bank APIs. And that's where I think there's a big opportunity for Interledger because clearing in the open banking space uh, isn't standardized. Even though they're all using O2 to set up the payment and get authorization, the actual banks all, um, haven't decided on like a standard API for actually doing the payment itself. And then settlement generally is, you know, Swift or standard bank networks. And finally, there's Interledger where I think, you know, we have an answer to discovery. We have payment pointers and I think they're really powerful. Uh, and what we're proposing is let's use OAuth 2 uh, in the same way as the open banking guys are leverage on a lot of the back of their work. But then instead of going off and speaking to bank APIs, once the payment's set up, just use Interledger. So you use Interledger to actually clear the payment. And then the beauty of the Interledger network is everyone on it clear settles bilaterally. And so settlement um, is way more flexible. And so OPay or OpenPay or something that we haven't found a good name for is, is effectively that. It's, it's OAuth plus payments. We've taken the OAuth protocol, the idea of I create this resource, which is an un, unexecuted payment. I get authorization to execute the resource uh, from the user and then I, and then I pay it. Um, it's, you know, it's what's quite nice about it as opposed to SPSP is OpenID Connect already gives you a framework for exchanging some identities. And so you can do things like say, well, I'm actually not going to allow unsolicited payments. The person has to identify who they are before they can send me money. Or you can actually get the, uh, have a way of getting the identity of the merchant whose site you're paying. And that can be shown to you in the consent form when you consent to the payment. Um, so I think, you know, at least from my, from my side, my opinion, what I've seen, you know, watching the industry is, delegated access to accounts is the way that payments are moving. Uh, certainly that's the way open banking APIs are moving. It seems like the card networks are slowly moving in that direction as well with uh, secure remote commerce or SRC. Um, 
which is basically saying, you know, store all your cards under an, an, a digital identity. And then when you want to make the payment, you go off and, and authorize it. And so uh, the flow would basically be very similar to OAuth, except in this case, the relying party is the person who either wants to be paid um, or is making the payment. They go off and do the discovery uh, using you know, the, the URL they got from the payment pointer. They um, create what we're calling either an intent or a mandate. So they you know, create this intent to make a payment or this intent to pull payments. Uh, then they go and get uh, authorization to access that. So that thing is then effectively the scope of what they're getting authorization for. And they go off and they get authorization from the account owner. Uh, and in the case of a, an intent, maybe you don't need authorization. So I may allow you to send me money without me knowing who you are. And that would probably be the way you would do it for something like web monetization. So in that case, it's very analogous to SPSP. Um, subtle differences. The, the final piece of the puzzle is what we call, I'm calling the loopback protocol. And basically, uh, and I credit Michiel de Jong um, with this name, we, we worked on this some time ago, as I said. Um, and basically what this means is when you, uh, you know, once you've got an auth token to access the counterparty's wallet, that will either be for you to send packets out of their wallet to yourself, or to send what packets to them that actually get, you know, you be, the final hop becomes a, a, a bilateral connection from them to you. So in the case of a push payment, um, you know, Alice on the left is sending to Bob on the right. Alice sends prepare packets over the interledger through a bunch of connectors. But when they land at Bob's wallet, Bob's wallet actually um, ha has established a temporary bilateral link back to Alice and forwards the packet all the way back to Alice. So it kind of goes in a loop. And at that point, Alice decides whether or not to fulfill the packet. So rather than um, having had to give Bob instructions built into the protocol about whether or not to fulfill the packet and how to do it, Alice has complete control over the flow. So Alice can decide I'm gonna fulfill this packet or Alice can decide, no, actually I'm gonna reject it because there were too many fees applied along the way and I actually don't want, um, I, I don't want uh, to fulfill it. What's really powerful is when you apply this in reverse for pull payments, imagine now that Alice has been through a whole OAuth flow uh, where Bob has given Alice permission to withdraw $10 from, um, from his account. In this case, Alice actually sends the packets through the bilateral connection directly to, um, to Bob's account, but they're addressed back to Alice. And so the packets flow from Bob's account all the way back to Alice, where she again decides whether or not to fulfill them. And in this way, she's actually sending money to herself out of Bob's account, but with complete control over how much and at what rates and so on she wants to accept. The precursor to stream was a protocol called PSK version two. Uh, I think there's room for us to look at PSK version three, which is somewhere between uh, what PSK two was and stream. So basically simplify stream significantly to make it easier for end nodes to use. Um, basically keep all of the best bits of stream. And I think there are some great bits in there, but simplify it by taking out the multiplexing and the bi-directional packet flows. What that means is as an end party, uh, it, it's much easier. If I want to send using this protocol, I only need the ability to send. I don't need to use web sockets. I don't need to host a, a web server, et cetera. I can, I can literally just send you know, HTTP requests as a way to complete a, a, a payment using this protocol. The conclusion for me is, is not that, um, uh, is not that we, like should do away with anything we've done. It's really that we should think a little bit about how ILP fits into the payments ecosystem today and embrace the opportunity that we have here where we've come up with what is, in my opinion, a great upgrade to the existing payment protocols. ISO 8583, for those of you who aren't aware, is mostly implemented based on still the 87 version, which basically as the name suggests, was developed in 1987. 
it predates the internet. So, you know, all of these card networks out there that are connecting to each other and card processors and acquirers and issuers, a lot of them are using a protocol that is literally, was literally published in 1987. And I think there's a fantastic opportunity for us to, you know, propose ILP as the successor to that and as a way to create this new global payments network with uh, bigger, more flexible, um, address space, better semantics, better separation of concerns between uh, payments and business logic. Uh, and then, you know, nothing stops uh, uh, infrastructure providers on that network still doing things like OER encoding um, and, and optimizations. And, and nothing stops us continuous, continuing to work on sort of futuristic use cases that use stream like peer-to-peer -peer payment networks and uh, you know, IOT payments and so on and so forth. But I think if we're going to be practical and we're going to get Interledger adopted by the existing payments ecosystem, we, we need to come up with end-to-end -end protocols. And those are the ones that we build on top of ILP that address common use cases, uh, you know, pull payments, push payments, remittances, check out online, those kind of things. At the moment, the only use case I see that we are able to address is web monetization realistically. And I think that's a problem.